And good morning once again. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. For those of you who are new, we are working our way through the book of 1 Samuel here at Calvary on Sunday mornings. And we come to chapter 30. And uh, let's just start with verse 1. Now what happened when David and his men came to Ziklag? On the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and all his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. David, if you've been reading the chapters we've been studying, David uh, was so busy trying to be successful in his profession as a military general leader, so busy making a name for himself and gathering more and more wealth that he neglected his family in the process, and so did all the guys that followed him. Neglected their families and left them vulnerable to the enemy. It wasn't until he and his men finally returned home. Now, they've been out in the battlefield fighting these battles and uh, doing all kinds of things. It wasn't until they returned home that they discovered the enemy had taken from them their wives, their children, and all the things they worked so hard to acquire. Only then did they realize success means nothing if it allows the enemy to steal from you what really matters. David was not unlike a lot of young professionals today that spend more and more time at the office conquering the corporate world, right? And building their portfolios that they neglect what re really matters in life. And winds up, the man who does this winds up losing his wife to another man, who then eventually becomes father to his children. You know, it may sound a little trite, it's nonetheless true. The most important things in life are the things that money can't buy. And I think this story, in some ways, reinforces the axiom, you really don't appreciate what you have until you lose it. Remember that. We often don't really appreciate what we have until we lose it. Now, let's back up and see what led to this terrible event taking place in David's life and, of course, the lives of his men. You have to understand, for over a year now, David and his men, and families, of course, have been living in Philistine country because David feared Saul, King Saul, would kill him. You read back in chapter 27, verse 1, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish some day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. So at this point, David now leaves the land of Canaan and moves into Philistine country. Now, the land of Canaan was the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the children of Israel. It was the promised land, right? And as such, it represented God's perfect will for his people's lives. The place of blessing, worship, because that's where the, temp the tabernacle was, and later on the temple, the place where you went to worship God. So in uh, the land of promise, there was blessing, there was worship, there was fellowship. You had God's people, right, that you could fellowship with and keep, you know, uh, to keep each other accountable and so on, speaking to each other's lives. So they had that. And of course, they had the fruitfulness that God promised them, both uh, of the land and, of course, spiritually. So Israel, when the people of God were in the land of Israel, land of Canaan, God promised to bless them because, again, it represented his perfect will for their lives. When they were out of the land of Canaan, whether uh, in judgment, as when the Assyrians and then later the Babylonians came and carried them off into captivity because of Israel's wickedness and their sin, uh, removing them out of the land of promise, or if one of them, like David in this situation, I believe is backslidden, and it leaves the land voluntarily, whenever the people of God were in the land, God promised to bless them. Whenever they were out of the land, it greatly restricted God's blessings upon their life, if not 
cut them off altogether. I mean, again, we have to understand what God is communicating here. God has a perfect will for our lives. He has a permissive will for our lives. And then he has a flat out will that is not according to anything that we want to do. And I believe that David was living outside the will of God. People argue, well, was he really backslidden? I'll let you decide that for yourself. But um, again, when they were out of the land, God's blessings upon them were cut off or greatly restricted. So by David leaving the promised land to live in the world now, quote unquote, again, the land of the Philistines, enemy territory, right there, guys, right there, he made his family and, of course, all the families of his men an easy target for the enemy's attacks. Look, you're inside the promised land. God promises to wash over you, protect you. There's an umbrella of protection. You move outside the promised land, you're kind of on your own. You're kind of now susceptible to the enemy. I, I just see in this a parallel to what we see going on today. What is God's perfect will for his people's lives today? Where do they find fellowship? Where do they worship? Where are the blessings of God going to flow in and through their lives? I believe as they are in fellowship with God's people in the local church. I don't personally believe you can be blessed and fruitful as God desires if you are not in fellowship in the local church. Yeah, but I get everything I need online, on radio. Be wary of those radio preachers, all right? They're not... <laughs> They never, ever are a substitute for not going to church. Hey, praise God we have avenues to listen to God's word in so many different ways. That does not replace you getting plugged into a local church because I believe that's where the fellowship takes place. We keep each other accountable. Uh, what is it? Uh, Hebrews 10, 24, 5. Don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. We need each other. You can't get fellowship. You can't speak into a person's life. They can't speak into your life if you're just listening to teaching on the radio. Praise God for that. It's not enough. You cannot be in God. Now, I have seen over the years that there have been men who have left the place of God's blessing, have left the local church. Why? Why have they done that? Well, sometimes they've backslidden and they have taken their families with them and they're not going to church anymore now. Sometimes, and this happens quite a bit today, sometimes their job moves them away from where their home was for many years, maybe, where they have a good church, a Bible teaching church, and their job has now moved them into a new town. They can't find a good church to go to. And besides all of that, now he's got to work on Sundays. There's a lot of reasons why men will forsake the fellowship of God and God's people in the local church. And when that happens, they begin to live in the world, you might say. I'm not saying that they necessarily... David didn't become an atheist or an agnostic. It's just that his walk with God was diminished. The blessings of God upon his life were restricted. You know, you can be outside of God's perfect will. God still loves you. Uh, you know, and, and all, and guys that move outside of God's perfect will and take a job and they're working on Sundays, working, uh, you know, so many hours during the week that, uh, that God is not a consideration anymore. They have cut themselves off from the people of God. And most importantly, they're neglecting their families because they're working so much. Well, that is a problem. This is what happened with David. Okay, he let his fear of Saul uh, cause him to leave God's perfect will. Look, Saul wanted to kill David, but God had promised David he would someday be king, right? David wasn't king yet, so there's no way Saul's going to kill him. But David had irrational fear, and we all have that at times, don't we? We know what God has said, we got his promises, but we're not sure he's going to really come through, right? And so we have this irrational fear, and often it causes us to move outside of his perfect will. So not only did David drag his family away from the promised land, to live among the Philistines, if that wasn't bad enough, once he gets there, he throws himself, and again, his men, into one military campaign after another, trying to build success and amass more and more wealth. And I'm just wondering, guys, if David at this point really has backslidden and his mindset has not been, is not so much spiritually focused as it is materially focused. I'm wondering if David now was becoming more like the Philistines, more like the unbelievers in the sense that materialism and success was more important than honoring God and obeying what God has said, especially in the home. I don't know. 
It seems like in chapter 30, verse 20, when God finally restored to David and his men all that the enemy had taken. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But listen to what David said in verse 20. Then David took all the flocks and herds they had driven before those other livestock and said, This is David's spoil. So he's claiming a big chunk of the spoil all right, for himself. And again, I'm wondering if money had become so important to David that it has now consumed his thinking. I mean, why had he left his family unprotected in the first place? While well, he and his men went out conquering and pillaging. I mean, what mattered more to him at this point? His family or his success and prosperity? Now, I might be being too hard on David. I hope so. David's one of my favorite guys in the, in, the, in the Old Testament. I mean, he's one of my heroes. I love David. I love his heart for the Lord. Just because David loved the Lord, it doesn't mean he was, you know, impervious to backsliding. You know, we, can all, we all love the Lord. It doesn't mean we're, we're, you know, invincible in that regard and then we'll never backslide. I think David could have had here a, a time where he had kind of backslidden. I know leaving the promised land to live in Philistine country wasn't a shining moment spiritually. But I might be being too hard on him. I might be misreading him as an overachiever at this point, a workaholic, and someone who's putting money and success above his family. That it could be. I hope I'm wrong. But even if I am wrong, maybe David was the greatest father and husband in the world, and I'm, you know, he was, he was, you know, this happened to him through no fault of his own. All right? But even if I am wrong about David, I know this. There are millions of professional people and corporate warriors in our country who are pouring huge amounts of time and energy in making a name for themselves in the business world. They are consumed with a desire for success and wealth. And if you were to challenge them on this point, no doubt they would not acknowledge that, that they were putting those things above their families. I've seen more than a few guys say to me, well, it's not, it's not about me. I, I don't care about the big house or the fancy car. I'm working all these hours for my family. <laughs> to give them everything they deserve. Well, what you're doing is you're sacrificing your family on the altar of materialism and success, and you don't even realize it. In fact, what's sad to me is that these folks are oblivious to the fact that the greatest gift that God has given to them on this earth, apart from salvation in Christ, is their family. Which if they continue to take for granted and ignore, they will lose. They will lose. Lose. And guys, know this. It's going to happen when they least expect it. Often we're at, when they're at the top of their game, like David. David is at the top of his game here. He's a young guy. He's victorious. One battle after the other. He is, he is making a name for himself. He is gathering more and more wealth. I mean, he's at the top of his game. And one day he comes home, and what does he find? Everything that is really important has been taken from him. His family... I mean, you know, his wife, his wife, he had two, his kids. I mean, it wasn't until he and his men finally came home after how many weeks out there fighting these battles, and they realized that their wives and kids had been taken from them. They knew they hadn't been killed because there were no bodies laying around. Thank God for that. But it finally dawns on them that they've lost what really matters. Guys, material things don't matter. Material, success doesn't matter. Success comes and goes, okay? Material things come and go. But your loved ones, your family, that's the most important thing God has given to you. Now let me broaden this message a little bit to go beyond just the young professional, you know, climbing the corporate ladder who is in danger of losing his or her family because of neglect. Because, guys, the lessons of this chapter can apply to all of us in some way, shape, or form. Because, really, the lesson is how to deal with crisis. Whatever form it takes. Now, when I originally gave this message, I titled it, When Life Takes a Turn for the Worse. And I began it by asking a couple of questions. First of all, what do you do when you're going along in life and things are going fine? You know, you're being blessed, your family is healthy, and your company is prospering. When all of a sudden, the bottom drops out. Your spouse wants a divorce. You find out your company is laying you off. The test results have come back, and either you or one of your kids is a very, very serious, even life-threatening disease. 
What do you do when the road you're on suddenly takes an unexpected turn and you find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be in, facing a situation you're not prepared to deal with? Well, that's exactly what happened to David and to his men. Now, we've already read how that, you know, they came back from this campaign. They were on this, again, military campaign, no doubt several. And as they're coming back towards their hometown of Ziklag, they no doubt see smoke in the distance. That's not a good sign. And the closer they get, the more they realize what has happened. Their city has been burned. How bad is it? They didn't know until they got right up into it. Once they got up into it, they realized their wives, their kids, their possessions have been taken. The city has been burned with fire. They're devastated. They're brokenhearted. In fact, they're so upset, they want to blame somebody. They want to hold somebody accountable. So what do they do? They hold David accountable. It wasn't David's fault, really. They were following him of their own free will, right? But you know, when you're upset, you want to blame somebody, right? So they said, you know, let's kill David. Well, thanks, guys. All right. So they, 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 were, they wanted to stone him because they were so upset. The word ziklag means winding road. And guys, that aptly describes the road of life. And how that life can be a series of twists and turns, right? You're going along fine where everything seems like smooth sailing, when all of a sudden the road you're on takes a turn you didn't see coming. And suddenly everything in life that matters to you, your marriage, your health, your financial security, is suddenly gone, or at very least is in danger of being taken from you. How do you handle that? What do you do? Where do you turn for help and strength? Well, look, David is called in Scripture by God himself a man after God's own heart. Now, that didn't mean David was perfect. We've talked about David's failings. But he did have a heart for God, okay? Even people with a heart for God can blow it. David was not a perfect guy. But we do know he was a saved guy. Saul, king, I'm not sure about him. We'll talk about him more next week. Well, I'm not sure about Saul. I, I don't th know if Saul really was a believer. David, we know, with all of his faults and flaws, he loved God. He was a true child of God. And I believe the Holy Spirit is holding David up here in this passage as an example of how all the children of God should handle a crisis, especially of this magnitude, all right? I mean, how did David handle this life-shattering event? Two main things, okay? First of all, verse 6, he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Verse 6, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Guys, let me say, the answer to every trial, every tragedy, every unexpected turn in the road of life is always the same for the child of God. We first of all strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. Good? Let's move on. Well, oh, wait, wait. Great. What does that mean exactly? All right? We preachers are famous for just dumping this stuff and then moving on. You're thinking, okay, but what does that look like? All right? How do I do that? Sure, strengthen myself in the Lord my God. What did David do? Well, I'm reading between the lines a little bit. Some of it's uh, obvious and communicated clearly. Some of it I just pieced together from knowing David and uh, him writing the Psalms and things. But how do you strengthen yourself in the Lord your God? Well, first of all, you remind yourself, listen, that God is still on the throne. He hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't vacated the throne, and now it's, you know, empty. The theologians call this sovereignty. That God is in control of every situation, not most situations, not situations up to 90% of the time. He is in control of every situation. And I believe the first thing David did, even though it's not mentioned specifically here, why do I believe he did this? Because it is, <clears throat> it is standard operating procedure for a spirit-filled man or woman of God. It's reflexive. We don't even think about it. All right? 
when a problem strikes or adversity strikes and we're facing a life-changing crisis, maybe, the first thing we do automatically is say, my God's on the throne. My God is bigger. He's with me. You're strengthening yourself in that knowledge. And I, I believe that David had this mindset because of different things in his life, not the least of which was the Psalms he wrote. Psalm 42, we read in verse 5, David said to himself, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Now David was going through something that caused him to write Psalm 42. We don't know what it was. Obviously, something that had him kind of, you know, bummed out, uh, maybe even very discouraged or, uh, you know, he just was very anxious, we'll say. And so how does he handle it? Well, he encourages himself. Say, so is it normal for a man to talk to himself like this? Let me just say this to you. It's okay to talk to yourself. You start arguing with yourself. That's a problem, okay? Get some help. Look, we encourage other people, don't we? I mean, when they're down or they're going through, we encourage them. Why can't we encourage ourselves, right? This is what David did. He said, why are you cast down, oh, my soul, you know? Why are you disquieted within me? Where's all this anxiety coming from? Don't you hope in God? I'm going to yet praise him for the help of his countenance is the idea. David was saying, look, soul, what are you worried about? Okay, so you're facing a crisis. So you're facing a problem that's bigger than you. Has God gone somewhere? Has God abdicated the throne? I mean, don't you understand that he is with you? That he is going to help you? That he is going to see us through this, whatever it is, this trial, this adversity. Uh, I'm going to hope in him and not give up is the idea of what David is saying in Psalm 42. So first of all, remind yourself that God is still on the throne. He's sovereign. He's bigger than any problem you're facing. Number two, take some time to quiet your heart in God's presence. I love Isaiah 30, verse 15. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. You know, just stop talking and worrying. Quietness. Get your heart quiet before the Lord and meditate on His strength. Be confident in his ability. Fight the temptation, guys, to let your circumstance drain you of all hope and faith in the Lord's power to overcome whatever it is you're facing. Again, follow David's example. Psalm 27. In fact, why don't you turn there? Psalm 27. I love this psalm, okay? David said in Psalm 27, starting with verse 13, I would have lost heart. I would have given up all hope. Unless I had what? Believed. What was that belief based on? God's word. God's character. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the what? Living. I'm so glad he didn't say that I would see the goodness of the Lord in heaven someday. Okay, that's great. That's not helping me too much right now, though. Well, sure, we know when we get to heaven, everything's going to be wonderful. I need God's strength and grace now in the land of the living, right, while I'm on the earth. And David said, look, I have confidence that God is with me. I have confidence that he is going to take care of this problem. I belong to him. I'm his child. He's promised to watch over me and take care of me. And if I didn't know that, if I didn't believe that, I, I would have lost all hope. I mean, I, I would have lost heart. If I didn't believe, I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Therefore, verse 14, says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Stop running around like a crazy person trying to, you know, work things out. Just stop and wait on the Lord. Give God time to work things through. Uh, the people of this world, guys, turn to pills and booze to get them through difficult times. But the children of God turn to the Lord for strength. Or we should, right? How about turning to Isaiah 40? In fact, I'll share two 
passages from Isaiah, one of my favorite books in the Bible, and two of my favorite passages in Isaiah. Isaiah 40, starting with verse 30. Even youths, young people, will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Those who trust, those who wait on the Lord. Because you're now drawing from His strength. I mean, our strength only goes so far. You can be a young guy or gal, Olympian. The Olympics are coming up in what? Um, what country is that? Uh, Brazil and um, these are these are the fittest people on the planet but even they're going to get tired e even their strength uh, is going to go so far but if you are drawing your strength from God he has unlimited strength that you can tap into and I can't tell you guys how many times I have been at the end of my strength physically and I've had to do some more stuff for the Lord I've had to go somewhere and minister and it's like, Lord, I have no physical energy or strength to do this. I need your strength. And boy, does God come through all the time, you know? I mean, you get that second wind, that's that Holy Spirit wind, you know? And, and I'm telling you, I, I, I'm amazed at the strength I have because I, I'm tapping into God's strength. That's what it is, right? Isaiah 41.10. We read, don't be afraid, for I am with you. God speaking, don't be afraid, I'm with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. So take some time to quiet your heart in God's presence. Number three, take refuge in his word and grab hold of his promises. Now, some of these are overlapping a little bit, but you understand. Turn to Psalm 34. All right, we're strengthening ourselves in the Lord our God. First of all, we remind ourselves that God is still on the throne. He's sovereign. Number two, we take some time to quiet our hearts before God in his presence. Number three, we begin to take refuge in his word. I don't know where you go when you're really facing a difficult time. I don't know where you go when you're troubled and things are crumbling around you. I go to the word. And I find a lot of comfort in the Psalms, by the way. Okay, I read the Psalms every morning. And then I get into the other scriptures that I'm, I'm working my way through different books. But I read a few psalms every morning because I love the psalms. I feel like God has so encouraged my heart through the psalms. And, and Psalm 34, I'm looking at right now, Psalm 34, verse 17. When I say take refuge in his word, grab hold of his promises. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to those. Uh, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. That's a promise of God. How about Psalm 46? Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. See what God is saying? When your whole world is cr coming crashing down around you, still remember that I am God and there's nothing hard for me. I promise to take care of you. I promise to be with you. Be still and know that deep, intimate kind of knowledge. Be still, draw close to me, and know that I am God. I'm your God. Number four, this is a big one. As you're strengthening yourself in the Lord, praise Him, listen, for what He's going to do. Now, you have God's promise, but it hasn't been fulfilled yet. 
So you know what you do? You praise him for what he's going to do. Why? Because he's promised he was going to do it. Even if you don't see it fulfilled. See? God has promised to... Well, let me just get, I'm getting ahead of myself. It, it doesn't say in this passage that David praised the Lord in this trial. Okay? It doesn't say that. I'm reading between the lines. Just again, drawing on, on my understanding of David as a man, a man of God. It doesn't say he praised the Lord in this trial. But if you know anything about David, you know he had a heart of worship and praise. And by that, I don't mean that he broke out in song. There. Okay. Or let his men in a chorus of how great thou art. Okay? I'm not saying that. I just believe that David spent a few minutes in his heart telling the Lord that even though he didn't quite understand why God allowed this, he praised God for how he was going to work things out. And even if David didn't do this, this is what we need to do. Although I believe David, because I just, I know David well enough to know that, and, it, and this stuff all might have happened within a, a few seconds, or, or, or a couple of minutes. We don't have to spend hours working our way through all this. Sometimes we don't have hours, right? You guys were wanting to stone him, all right? And, you know, he didn't have a whole bunch of time. He just strengthened himself in the Lord as God. And I think he went through these things almost, again, reflexively. Just thanking God, though, for what he was going to do. I, I believe he did spend some time offering God praise in the midst of this circumstance. This horrible circumstance. And we should, too. But I know people are thinking that, look, what if I don't feel like praising God when I'm going through a horrible circumstance? Well, I understand that. Okay. There are times we don't, quote unquote, feel like praising God. So what do you do? You praise Him anyway. It's what the Bible calls a sacrifice of praise. It's going to cost you something to praise. Sometimes the praise just pours out because God's blessing us so abundantly. The praise just pours out. Not costing us anything to praise Him, right? But when you're going through an adversity, a trial... And you don't know what is going on. Uh, you don't know why God's allowed this. My pastor used to like to say, if you're going through a situation and you don't know what God is, do, uh, you know, what what God is doing, fall back on what you do now. And God's a good God, a loving God, who has promised to watch over you and take care of you. But there are times when we don't feel like offering God praise. Do it anyways. Because praise, guys, is a manifestation of faith. I'm only going to praise Him if I really trust Him. And when I trust Him, that's when I'm connected to God. Faith, trust, connects us to God and allows the power of God to flow from God into our lives. Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please Him. And I believe that faith is manifested in praise. Because, let's say... You only sing when you are, you know, when you are feeling like the situation is taken care of. I'm, I'm praising God because he's got it covered, right? Guys, I've been encouraged and strengthened many times. When I was facing a difficult circumstance, uh, a trial, some adversity, some crisis, or a decision I didn't know what to make, I, what to, to, to do. And often what I do is, uh, I'll either get somewhere uh, just alone with God. Um, you know, I, it might be I'll take the car and park somewhere and just put the, the radio on and I've got my iPod in there and it's got all kinds of Christian music on there. Uh, or I'll take a walk with my headphones on and I'll just listen to praise music. Praise music has a way of resetting us, doesn't it? It gets our eyes off of the problem and gets our eyes on to the one to whom there is no problem. Praise music, when it talks about God's greatness and goodness and love, it, re, it, it helps to bring me to a point, and you, where now I'm not focusing on the problem. I'm focusing on the Lord. And I'll tell you what, that just encourages me. It revives me. It, it just gives me strength for the situation. And again, guys, praising God for what He's going to do, even before He does anything, is something we need to do because it's a manifestation of faith. And again, it connects us to God in a way that allows His power to flow into our lives. So first, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And then secondly, he inquired of the Lord. Very, just two simple things. He first of all in, in, uh, encouraged himself in the Lord, and then he inquired of the Lord. Verse 7 and 8. 
Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. Now the ephod was a piece of clothing that the priests wore, and inside it had the Urim and Thummim. What is that? We don't know. It means lights and perfections in the Hebrew. Uh, some people think it was a white stone and a black stone. We don't know. It was used, though, for the purpose of discerning the will of God. So David has encouraged himself in the Lord. Now he asked for the ephod because he wants to inquire of the Lord. Verse 8, so David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? Lord, we can't sit here feeling sorry for ourselves all day. We've got to move out. What do you want us to do? Do you want us to go forward, pursue the Amalekites, or do what do you want us to do? Guys, so often, when things take a turn for the worse in our lives, don't we spend most of the time panicking and trying to figure a way, trying to figure a way how we're going to fix it? And then we finally maybe pray last, if at all. And here's our prayer. Okay, God, I've got it all figured out. Now, will you just bless this? Here, here's my plan, Lord. It's, it's a good plan. Will you get behind me here? Bless this plan. And God doesn't ever listen to me. He, he never, you know, he, he's never once said, Phil, that's an excellent plan. I, I wish I would have thought of that. Uh, no, he doesn't do that. But we, we often pray last, when really prayer is one of the first things we ought to do. Again, I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do. And he will show you which path to take. That's a promise of God. But we have to do the first part of it. Trust him with all our heart. Don't lean on our own human understanding. In everything that we face, we need to seek him. And then he will direct our paths. So after encouraging himself in the Lord, David then inquires of the Lord. Verse 8, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered David, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Look, guys, if you're one of those alcohol, we're alcohol, workaholics, <laughs> you're a workaholic, you might be an alcoholic, I don't know. <laughs> but if, you know, you're one of those workaholics we talked about earlier who has lost your spouse and family because you've been working like a crazy person at work and so on, building a name for yourself and success and wealth and so on, then I think this applies to you especially. What should you do? You've come home, your wife has left you, taken the kids. What do you do? Get right with God. Acknowledge that you were wrong. You got your priorities out of whack. Examine yourself. When you... Uh, you know, encourage yourself in the Lord. That doesn't mean God isn't going to, you know, take you to the woodshed. He's going to tell you, hey, look, here's why this happened. You, you didn't cherish your wife. You neglected your kids. It was all about making money and being successful. That's why they, they've, they're gone. You've allowed the enemy to take them from you. Now, here's what you need to do. Get in your face, repent, confess these things to me. I will forgive you and then get out there and win them back. But because you're going to be a new man or a new woman, you're going to put me first. You're going, to, you're going to surround your family with the spiritual covering that a man of God should protect his family with. When you get your priorities right, you put me first, your family second, ministry third, and yourself last. That's when things will start turning around. You know, I think of the church of Ephesus. <laughs> what a church they were. They were a good church. They were doctrinally sound. In fact, they worked tirelessly for the Lord. Here's the problem. And it's a strange problem. When a Christian who loves the Lord begins to work so hard for the Lord, they begin to neglect the Lord. Again, like the man who works, loves his family, loves his wife, works so hard for them, he begins to neglect them. That was Ephesus. And in Revelation 2, Jesus Christ fires off a letter to them, which John the Apostle wrote down. 
Basically, acknowledging all the hard work. You're working to the point of exhaustion. You're a discerning church. You are not letting, you know, these false teachers come in. You're a good church. But I have this against you. You've left your first love. And if you don't get back to me, if you don't come back to me, oh, but Lord, we're serving you. I don't need you to serve me. I appreciate it. I can send angels and they do a much better job than you. What I want from you is not your service as much as your love. That's why I've redeemed you. That's why I've died for you. That's why I've entered into this covenant with you. I want you. And he says, unless you... And he lays out a very simple three-step process for restoring their relationship with him. Verse 5 of Revelation 2. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works. Remember, repent, repeat. Remember what? Remember your first love. Now, of course, in this context is Jesus, but it applies to marriage. The word love there, or remember from whence you have fallen, it's talking about honeymoon love. Honeymoon love. The love that you first had for each other when you got married. And that honeymoon period. Remember the kind of relationship you had with your spouse when you first got married. Repent, you know, which means to turn around. You've moved away from that relationship because of money or success or whatever. Turn around, repent, and repeat. Do your first works. Get back to that place where you are now cherishing them and spending time with them that they become the priority. Of course, it's it, first and foremost, our relationship with Jesus, of course. But if more... Husbands and wives put this into practice in their marriage. You'd have very few divorces in this country. As a pastor, I get one of the joys that I have is to marry couples. One of the happiest days in their lives, when they stand before God and family and commit themselves to each other in marriage. It breaks my heart to see those same two people a year later, three years later, where they've moved so far away from each other, they, are, they can't stand to be in each other's presence. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow drifting. Just like you drifting away from Jesus, it can happen in your marriage. You have to keep cultivating honeymoon love. You cannot let anything come between you. Not the job, not success, nothing. Materialism, When you inquire of the Lord, okay, you've encouraged yourself in the Lord, now you're inquiring of Him. Remember that what He tells you to do, make sure that you do it with all your heart. That's the first point under that second main point. We're inquiring of the Lord, yes, and when the Lord tells you what to do, listen to me, obey God completely and with all your heart in all He tells you to do. Guys, the solution to every problem in difficult circumstances, first of all, turning to the Lord for strength and then guidance. Where do we find guidance? For the most part, from His Word. And when He shows us things in His Word, guess what? We need to do all He has said. Now listen, where do you go? To the Lord, to His Word. Not to your friends. Not to counselors. You go to God's Word. I just talked to a guy after first service. We were talking about some of the people that had used to walk with the Lord that he knew, and I know. One couple hasn't gone to church for 15 years. Christian couple. They've got numerous problems. And all they do is go to secular counselors. No wonder things aren't getting any better. Who's the wonderful counselor? Jesus Christ. And he's given us a whole book of counsel. Didn't Jesus say himself in Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every or what at most? No, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. No, it's every word. Remember what he said to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 8 of the book of Joshua? He said, Joshua, study this book. He's talking about the law of God, the word of God. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to, to obey, listen, everything written in it. 
Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Notice how God is emphasizing the every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Uh, meditate on His words so that you obey everything that's written therein. Why is God stressing? I'll tell you why. Because we have a, a kind of a um, habit of picking and choosing from God's word the things we like and then don't like. It's what some have called salad bar spirituality. I mean, we all like a good salad bar, right? We used to have Sizzlers in the area. They're still out west. And when I go out west, I, I like to go to Sizzler and, and all. And uh, one of the things I really like is their salad bar. You been to a Sizzler salad bar lately? It's huge. It's huge. I love it. Why? Because I don't have to have anybody tell me what I'm going to eat. When I order something, that's all that comes on the plate. And I maybe want a little variety. So a salad bar, I can go and pick and choose whatever I want. Some people bring that mindset to the Bible. And they say, well, I, I like this. I'll take that. Oh, this, I don't care about that repentance stuff. Uh, I like this over here. <laughs> Dying to self. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> Taking up the cross. No. You know. And they pick and choose. What, and then they obey only what they want to obey. And this is why there's so many problems in their lives. God says, this work that way. If you want me to be with you and bless you and so on, you've got to obey everything I've said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do the things that I tell you, right? Luke 6, 46. Jesus said to a group of would-be disciples. Number two, obey God completely. Number two, remember that anxiety, that anxiety, worry, and fear will rob you of God's peace. Turn to Philippians 4. Oh, this is one we've all got memorized, right? Philippians 4, verse 6. Paul said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Guys, the English word worry comes from an old German word meaning to strangle or choke. And that's exactly what worry is. It's a kind of mental and emotional strangulation, which probably, I, I might be wrong, but probably causes more mental and physical harm to us than any other single thing. I mean, worry is not only bad for you physically, it's detrimental to your spiritual health as well. It will rob you of your peace, your joy, your hope, and sometimes even your faith. That's why God said in no uncertain terms in Psalm 38, verse 7, don't fret, don't worry, it only causes harm. Yeah, but I'm a worrier. Okay, I'm a worrier. I know I shouldn't worry, but I worry. I understand that. But you know what? It's not any different than any other problem that we have in our flesh. You know, some are worriers, some lust, some are into the pornography, others are, you know, into cigarettes or drugs of some kind. The answer is the same for all of it. Draw close to God. He will give you victory. Draw close to God. I believe the closer you draw to God, the more you'll understand His character. You'll, you will have a, a faith in His promises. And that's going to alleviate worry. Worry will not be something you have to attack uh, as a direct uh, pursuit, it will just fall by the wayside uh, as a byproduct of just you drawing close to the Lord, getting to know Him, right? Number three, wait on God until you see your circumstance turn, uh, see how your circumstance turns out. I mean, you know, give God a little time to work, okay? Wait on God until you see how your circumstance turns out. Remember that what seems black today can be turned completely around by God tomorrow. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently. Now David was talking about being in despair and so on. Uh, he prayed. He waited on God. Look, look at what God did. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Guys, do you realize one of the big reasons God allows us to go through adversity is to put us on display so the world can see 
that our God's real. That's what we talk about God, right? We witness up to people about how big our God is, but they're watching to see if we really believe what we tell them. And so when adversity strikes us, and we go through it with peace, we trust God, we're praying, our countenance is even joyful because He's going to take care of it. When God comes through, and He always does, those people around us that don't know the Lord look at our lives and go, wow, they really do believe this stuff. Their God is real. You know what? I'd like to know that God. I'd like to make Him my God. That's part of it, guys. All right, let's finish up. Back to 1 Samuel 30. You can read the whole chapter. David does exactly what God tells him to do. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything, which they had taken, which had been taken from them. David recovered all. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. Not some, not most, but all. And guys, I believe this is the will for God, of God for our lives as his children. He wants us to recover all that the enemy, the devil, and sin has ripped off from us. Now, I can't guarantee all of it's going to be restored in this life. Uh, there are some situations that, you know, some times uh, a marriage is so badly damaged that it can't be repaired. There are some situations that God is not going to, you know, if a loved one dies, he's not going to restore them in this life. But if they know the Lord, you will see them again someday in heaven. And I believe in heaven, everything is going to be restored many times over. All the years the locusts have eaten, all the trials, all the suffering is going to be eclipsed by an eternity of joy unspeakable, full of glory. Until then, guys, no matter how badly the enemy attacks you, don't give up. Keep fighting. Keep fighting until you gain a victory. Don't give up, but strengthen yourself daily in the Lord, your God. Here's the bottom line. Will you love God and trust and praise Him only when He blesses your life the way you want Him to? In other words, are you going to be a fair-weather Christian? As long as the weather is fair, skies are blue, God's my man. But if adversity comes, if trials come, are you going to abandon God? Well, he let me down, you know. It wasn't part of the deal for me to go through this adversity. Well, I don't know what deal you're talking about, but Jesus talked about a cross if you follow him. Are we going to only love him and praise him when things are going well? Or are we going to love him and trust him and praise him no matter what? Because God said, look, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. They're not thoughts of evil. I love you. There are thoughts of peace to give you a future and to hope. Trust me. You don't know what I'm up to. You don't know why I've allowed this adversity. Do you trust that I love you? Hang in there. Hang in there. I love the words of Paul, and I'll end with this. Paul said, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for your life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why did Paul say in everything give thanks? Because he said in Romans 8 that everything is working together for our good. Because God loves us. If I believe that, that God has got good for me in mind, well, then I can thank Him in everything. Maybe not for everything. Well, the car blew up, you know, my dog died. Oh, praise God. And you thank God in everything. God's working, right? And so again, even though we don't know what He's doing, if I praise Him, love Him, it's a manifestation of faith. And God will use that to draw us closer to Him and use us in greater ways for His glory. And I don't know about you, but that's where I, what I want. Amen? you would be used in a greater way for His glory. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you, Lord, that David teaches us, or your spirit really through David is teaching us, just a very simple thing when we face severe crises, that we encourage ourselves in you and then we inquire of you. Because, Lord, ultimately we want to be led by you in everything. Our lives are yours. 
And Lord, we want to be more like Jesus, and sometimes that means adversity has to whittle us and uh, shape us into the image of Christ. But Lord, give us grace never to turn against you, never to be a fair-weather Christian, but in all things to love you and praise you. Because you're a good God. You have our best interests at heart. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we want to be a light to this world to give us grace. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your love. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May God give you guys an awesome week. May he fill you with his spirit. May he demonstrate to you his deep love for you and use you in greater ways for his glory. God bless you guys. Have a great week.